Okay, I think we've got most of our attendees in now, so let's begin. Uh, hello and welcome to this special online panel from the Mile End Institute in partnership with Progressive Britain on the 40th anniversary of the Limehouse Declaration. We are delighted that you can join us this evening for what promises to be a fascinating and insightful event. My name is Colin Murphy and I'm Deputy Director of the Mile End Institute. To briefly introduce ourselves, the Mile End Institute is a non-partisan organisation founded by the distinguished historian Lord Hennessy at Queen Mary University of London. It connects academics with policymakers and the public to throw light on the great issues of our time. We host regular online panels, events and talks like this one, and we also run a lively podcast series on a variety of uh, themes. To find out more about uh, our events, our future events, and also to catch up with past ones, you can head over to our website and sign up to our mailing list using the links that my colleague Sophia will put in the chat. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Equivalent. And to find out more about our partners in this event, Progressive Britain, you can also follow them on social media, check out their own podcast, and see their website. On the 25th of January, 1981, four heavyweight politicians and former cabinet ministers, Shirley Williams, Roy Jenkins, David Owen, and Bill Rogers, lobbed a stick of dynamite into the British party system. As the British left descended into civil war and during a wider economic and social crisis, the Gang of Four, as they became known, released a statement, the Limehouse Declaration that indicated their decision to leave the Labour Party and form a new movement for social democracy. They eventually founded the Social Democratic Party, forging an electoral alliance with the historic Liberal Party and fighting the general elections of the 1980s against both Margaret Thatcher's Conservative Party and the Labour Party of Michael Foote and Neil Kinnock. Their most visible legacy today is the Liberal Democrats, the product of a 1988 merger between the SDP and the Liberals, although one of the gang, David Owen, refused to join, and a small SDP party does continue to exist today. Meanwhile, some SDP veterans rejoined the Labour Party in the 1990s, primarily. The 1981 schism is unquestionably one of the most controversial decisions in contemporary British political history. It was also a consequential moment for the main strands of non-conservative politics in that era. So democratic, socialist, liberal, and social democratic, and indeed for British party politics and perhaps the constitutional system more generally. The debate surrounding that split touched on profound questions over labor relations, Britain and Europe, defense policy, the market and the state and democracy with which politicians in all parties still grapple. And today, there are several potential parallels. The Conservative government is attempting to forge a new paradigm shifting agenda after Brexit. The Labour Party struggles to recover lost ground and amazingly, yet again, splits over its internal constitutional rules. The Lib Dems and increasingly perhaps the Greens try to challenge the main parties and some journalists and politicians call for a progressive alliance, as they call it. It seems an ideal time, therefore, to revisit the STP and ask what origins, what its origins and what its fate might tell us about contemporary politics. So to discuss the Limehouse Declaration, its legacies and its potential lessons, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by a truly stellar panel. Our first speaker this evening is the Right Honourable Sir Vince Cable, Sir Vince was leader of the Liberal Democrats from 2017 to 2019, member of parliament for Twickenham from 1997 to 2015 and 2017 to 2019, and secretary of state for business innovation and skills during the coalition government. He was, I believe, SDP candidate for York in the 1983 and 1987 general elections. 
Our next guest is the Right Honourable Charles Clark, who was Home Secretary for Tony Blair's Labour government from 2004 to 2006, and Member of Parliament for Norwich South from 1997 to 2019. And as Chief of Staff for the Labour leader in Ilkinnock from 1983 to 1992, he had a ringside view of post-Limehouse British politics. Our third guest is Polly Toynbee, an author, campaigner and journalist for The Guardian, among others, with long-standing expertise in British politics, social policy and social democratic politics. Toynbee was the SDP candidate for Lewisham East in the 1983 general election and subsequently rejoined the Labour Party. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Julie Smith, or Baroness Smith of Newnham, a Liberal Democrat member of the House of Lords and a fellow in politics at Robertson College, Cambridge, where she was director of the European Centre from 2013 to 2019. Now, I read online, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I read online that she first became involved in politics, campaigning at the age of 12 for Shirley Williams, one of the Gang of Four. Correct. Yeah, good. I'm glad that's right. And finally, we are joined by Dr. Peter Sloman, a senior lecturer in politics, also at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of Churchill College. Peter is an expert historian in modern British politics, public policy and political ideas, publishing on the Liberal Party and the economy, the Liberal Democrats, and more recently, the history of the universal basic income. Thank you all of us for joining us this evening. Now, in terms of format, each of the panelists will speak for seven minutes in the order I just introduced them. I will then open the discussion up to questions from the floor. Um, panelists, please do try and keep roughly to the seven minutes as we want plenty of time for questions. And we'll finish by 8.30 p.m. In the audience, if you have a question, please do post it in the chat box or using the Q&A function. And you can also tweet any questions and comments using the hashtag MEI hyphen SDP. So if we're all ready, without further ado, let me please hand over to Sir Vince to kick off the panel. Well, first of all, thanks to you for setting up this, uh, you know, very timely event uh, and for asking me to contribute to it. Uh, I should perhaps just say a few personal words about how I got into the SDP uh, gives a little bit of context. Um, I, I think I was the, the, the second uh, SDP graduate who sort of led the Lib Dems, uh, Charles Kennedy in much happier times. Um, and I was also one of the few SDP graduates who sat in the cabinet. But since my colleagues included Chris Grayling and Liz Truss, I think amongst others, it, it's not something I make much of. Um, my own um, decision to join the, the Lib Dems, uh, the, well, the SDP originally, had very little to do with the Limehouse Declaration, actually. I, I was a reasonably contented member of the Labour Party. I'd probably have stayed there. I'd worked with John Smith in the Labour government as his special advisor, um, and very high regard for him and, and people like him. But I made the terrible mistake of going along to meetings of the local Labour Party in Twickenham, uh, which had been taken over by the trots, uh, and we were passing motions uh, addressed to Mao Zedong and um, President Brezhnev, ur urging them to stop a, a border conflict, which was dividing the forces of world socialism and sitting around deciding who would sit on the workers' committee when the revolution took over Twickenham. Uh, and the whole thing was just utterly bizarre. Uh, some of us joined the SDP, the leader of the Labour group joined the Tories. Um, and the Trot leader, who was the inspiration behind all this, eventually became a Catholic priest, in which capacity he married my son, and eventually became one of the Lib Dems' uh, best deliverers in, in the borough. So um, the world went in peculiar directions. But in terms of the lessons that you know, we learn from the SDP history. I, I suppose the obvious is, is a structural one, the extraordinary difficulty of launching a new party, a new movement under the British first past the post system. Um, I mean, the SDP lasted as a, an independent entity, um, albeit in an alliance for six years. 
uh, Change UK more recently lasted six weeks. Um, and, and when we look back at the 1983 elections, um, you know, the numbers actually speak for themselves. I mean, the alliance of 29 SDP, uh, which one was a Tory, the other Labour, and 11 Liberals, that was 40 of them went in and 23 survived. Um, and that was with 25% of the popular vote. I mean, the, the, the Labour Party had, I think, 28% of the popular vote and had 209 MPs. I mean, it's just the whole uh, system, the first past the post system was very heavily skewed against a, a new entrant with a broad national appeal, but with, with, without a local, a local base. And even in the merged party, the, the high points in our electoral fortunes was 2005 when we got 62 MPs and, you know, we sadly fallen a long way behind that now. Um, and the Green Party, as you know, has, has, has also tried to pursue an independent existence, has never got beyond one MP. Um, so, so what are the lessons we draw from this? I mean, I think the, one of them is that the, the voting system drives politics and political ideas rather than the other way around. And, and there's an interesting contrast in terms of what's currently happening in, in Western Europe, where uh, social democratic parties now lead the government, I think, in every Scandinavian country and potentially in Germany on Sunday, um, despite the fact that they've suffered the same kind of decline in, in you know, working class support uh, that the Labour Party has suffered in the UK and their vote share in most of those countries is down to around 20%. But under a proportional voting system, they're able nonetheless to command a great deal of um, power, uh, which is very difficult in the, the UK context. Um, I think a second practical conclusion is that if you are um, trying to launch a new movement, um, our experience and more recently the Greens is that it, it, it's very difficult to break through under the first past the post system nationally. So you have to develop a guerrilla um, strategy based on local activism and local government. And the liberals were, were very good at that um, and indeed tended to dominate the, um, the Dem uh, alliance as, as it matured for that reason. Um, and I suppose the final point I would make, which is sort of forward looking, um, is that it's the only way the Lib Dems, the Greens, any new formation uh, are likely to break through is if we have a change in the electoral system and that there's an inherent problem that Turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Why should the parties that benefit from it change the system to their disadvantage? It may just be that the current difficulties with the Labour Party in reclaiming um, its past position and particularly the losses in Scotland may persuade the Labour Party to adopt um, electoral reform. Um, there seems some moves in that direction and that would be very, very valuable if it happened. Uh, but of course, they've got to get into government first, which at the moment looks a very um, tough call. Um, I'm certainly one of those people who believes that we should have a tacit um, alliance understanding with the Labour Party and indeed the Greens and Plaid Cymru, as we had last time. Um, very difficult to, to make work. It, it sort of happened in 1997, um, but reproducing that under present conditions would be quite difficult. But I'm certainly very much in favour of it. Um, so my second major point is really about the kind of political ideas and themes that you find in the Limehouse Declaration and, and what relevance they those have today. Um, I was rereading the Declaration and it, it, it is very much a document of its time. Uh, I mean, it is preoccupied with issues which were relevant then but aren't really relevant now. The, 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 what were then the considerable power of the trade unions, which now only exist in the public sector, effectively. Um, there was a great deal of preoccupation with, with NATO and missile deployment, which of course, before the end of the Cold War. Um, 
Um, there was, a, I, th I think, a sort of chronic misjudgment, which we all made at the time, of the potential popularity of Margaret Thatcher, um, which, of course, we were, you know, the, the SDP were overwhelmed by the Falklands War. That's really what punctured the, punctured the balloon. Uh, and I think the only one of the SDP leaders who had a sort of I I intuition about this problem uh, was David Owen. I mean, he, he wasn't terribly helpful in the way he behaved himself, but he did understand that, you know, patriotism um, and the kind of soft nationalism, if you like, had to be part of the armory of a um, new party. Uh, and he, he grasped that. And that led on to my um, to my final point, which is, are there any of those dividing lines of um, so long ago, which are still relevant today? And I, I suppose Europe is is the, the one big one. Um, but of course, things were very, very different then. It was the Labour Party that had problems with the European Union. The Tories, led by Margaret Thatcher, were very strong pro-Europeans at that point. The whole thing has been turned on its head. Um, but there is a big question now as to whether Europe has actually disappeared from British politics as an issue. Um, Keir Starmer's strategy appears to be to accept that you know, Brexit has happened, it's history, we've got to move on and define ourselves in other ways. I guess the Lib Dems will take the opposite view that we have to be European and that we're going to get a time not too far off where we get some new nasty Republican government in the United States, which will um, force us to look again at Europe. But, you know, there is an argument about whether that big fault line which was a key part of the breakaway of the SDP, which is around membership of the European Union, it is now a dead issue, uh, or whether indeed it, it's dormant and will be reactivated before very long. So I hope that's a, a few ideas to, to get you going. Thank you. Thanks so much. Can I now pass over to Charles? Charles, you're muted. Thank you, pardon. Um, elementary mistake. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me to this panel, and I congratulate the Marlin Institute on organising this. I think we mean, need far more discussion of this kind of political question generally, and this is a very good um, process for doing it. I also think the issues in this are highly contemporary. During the period when Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party, I remember a range of different conversations with people who said, shouldn't we leave the Labour Party and set up an SDP again? It's hopeless in the, in the Labour Party, either for electoral reasons, or people were so angry, understandably so, about the anti-Semitism which was being demonstrated by the Labour Party at that time, that they really felt you couldn't be in this party, we should set up something else. And I think that summarises a big issue here. Uh, I think the SDP itself, and indeed the other alternatives, Change UK that Vince mentioned, are essentially judgments against the main parties, rather than judgments for something else. It's people who, for whatever reason, can't tolerate Labour, can't tolerate the Conservatives, and think it's so bad, we've just got to uh, go out. I very well remember the 1980 Labour Party conference rally where the four STP members spoke. It was an electric rally, but it was a tirade against what Labour then was, for understandable reasons, by the way. But it wasn't a tirade as to what needed to be done positively, I thought, in the future. And that takes me to my first main point. It's not just about the electoral system. Vince is completely correct that the electoral system creates a framework within which we all have to operate, uh, which is difficult and problematic for minority views in all the main parties and in lots of other areas. But people often think it's just the electoral system. I think it's more than that. It's also about the need to have an ideological offer, offer which is more than being just about good technocratic government, efficient government, government of the technocrats or whatever. It's also got to have a clear ideological direction about what it's going to be. I don't think the SDP really achieved that. I don't think Change UK, to give the example more recently, really achieved that. I think they were about what was so wrong 
with mainly the Labour Party at that time, but it can arise for the Conservatives as well, rather than where we ought to be going in the future. All elections are judgments on the main parties, but mainly judgments on the party in power. But it's no good running for election on the ground that we're not the other lot. I would argue that Labour's mistake since 2010 has been to make its central theme, we're not the Conservatives. And I don't think that's a central way that anybody can win power. You have to stand for something. And so, for example, on the Europe example that Vince gave just at the end there, where I think he's quite right to highlight it in the way he has, the question is, what are political parties saying should be our future relationship with Europe? And getting agreement on those questions to stand for whatever the stance that one wants to take. And the same is true on tax and spend, the same is true on our general international stance, the same is true on law and order, and all those kinds of issues. You've got to stand for something. And I think that's a key message uh, for all parties, including Labour, uh, at this time. And I think that you can't just say we're not the other ones. And I think that's an absolutely critical point and was a fundamental reason, really, for the failure of the SDP at that time uh, and the uh, failure of any of the other alternatives to really get lift off. So what are the suggestions I would make? Firstly, I think you do have to take head on the voting system points. My solution is alternative vote in single member seats, not pure PR, for a number of reasons which I won't articulate here unless anybody wants to take the discussion further forward. But my fundamental reason for that is that you want to have a political system which promotes working together, promotes collaboration, promotes people seeing what are the alliances to move forward in different directions. And I think the only uh, system that really does that is a system of alternative vote, which promotes people at both local level and at national level to say, what are the, where are the second preferences, the third preference votes going? How can we collaborate and work things through in that way? And that's my first message. You've got to establish that. The second message is a reinforcement of the same point about the need for people to work together. The left so-called, the centre-left so-called, has been absolutely beset by a whole series of conflicts, including very personal examples, which make it very difficult to get common approaches, common attitudes. Vince, you mentioned rightly the position of David Owen, a man who had great vision in many ways, but found it impossible, even in the constraints of the SDP, to work with other people in those kinds of ways. And actually, one's got to find a style of politics which is collaborative and working with other people, respecting other, and that needs to be a core part of the way politics moves forward. And the third thing is the point I just made again about the critical importance of standing for something. That's a challenge for Labour this week in Brighton and will be the challenge for the period up to the election. What, what are you going for if you vote Labour? And that's very, very difficult. Uh, it, there are a lot of difficult challenges to get that face up to what is it and where are we dealing with. And I think the lesson I draw from the SDP is, yes, they were in great difficulty given the electoral system there was, but more than that, they didn't have a clear uh, positive choice that they were offering people. And at the end of the day, that made it very, very difficult for them to break through in that kind of way. And uh, I argued, uh, to go back to where I started, with all the people during the Corbyn leadership of the Labour Party, he was saying, we've got to get out, set up another party, do run an SDP again. There's no choice but to work within the Labour Party to get it back to a place where it offers coherent alternatives to the country with a coherent le leadership. And within the Conservatives, I'd say the same is true. The Conservatives haven't split over Europe. They haven't split over one nation Tories and they've had massive divisions, but we haven't seen another party be formed. So you've got to work to change your party to take it in the direction that it needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Polly. There we go. Um, having been in the SDP, having stood as a candidate in 1983, I think Charles is quite harsh on our manifesto then. I think it was very positive. I think it's important to go back and look at how 1981 felt at the time. 
I mean, there was Margaret Thatcher, at that point, the most unpopular prime minister, I think almost that there had ever been. Uh, we were in the depth of a depression. Youth unemployment was appalling. A lot of those people who were thrown out of work then were scarred for life. There a lot of social research to show that, how damaging it was. The abrupt closures of uh, industries and mines around the country was dreadful. Um, and on the other side, there was Michael Foote, who had kept, ha had the special Wembley Labour Conference, which had voted to be out of NATO and out of the EEC, out of Europe, which was unthinkable for a lot of us to be out of Europe. Um, and the chasm between those two was so enormous that uh, it's not surprising that the SDP did phenomenally well right up until the Falklands War, or very nearly up until the Falklands War, which was April 82, uh, which turned her fortunes in the most remarkable way. She took fantastic risks uh, with our troops, our fleets, uh, and won, um, and never looked back after that. But the damage that she left behind her was appalling. Now, if like you were the Labour Party, the Lambeth Labour Party, which was the original loony Labour Party, though actually Twickenham sounds quite good too, but in Lambeth, they were actually in control of the council on running it into the ground, uh, where meetings went on till three o'clock in the morning until they'd driven everybody else out. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, it didn't seem to be impossible, and it seemed to be plenty of very positive, what are you for territory between those two, that Scylla and Charybdis. Um, so that's why I joined. I was, you know, I've been a Lambeth Labour Party member. Um, personally, the SDP taught me a hell of a lot. My only engagement with active politics uh, as a candidate, um, the pain of schism, certainly learnt that in Labour. In the Guardian Canteen, people would pick up their plates and move away. If S Quite a lot of us were SDP candidates. The left and the S versus the SDP was very um, evident there. So it wasn't just in Westminster, it wasn't just in local parties and local politics, but uh, all over the place, that split ran very deep and painful. The other thing I suppose I learned, as Charles was suggesting, is that how personal politics are, that rivalries between the gang of four and the split between Jenkins and Owen that's turned up almost from day one, the personalities really matter when people say, oh, politics isn't about personality. Oh, yes, it is. An enormous amount and much more than I've realised. By the time we got to 1987, after the failure of a second election, and I was on the National Committee, I'd been on, elected onto the National Committee from the start, the blood on the floor was uh, spectacular. Um, even the saintly Shirley Williams, who was then chairing that National Committee, uh, was up to all sorts of tricks of waiting room. It was split absolutely down the middle about whether or not to merge with the Liberals. Um, all sorts of uh, chairperson's tricks we in use. And so the ruthlessness of politics, even within a failing split party like the SDP, taught me a lot. At one point, Roy Jenkins thumped the table, pointed a finger at me and called me Madame Defarge, um, which is a very Roy Jenkins sort of insult. He later, <laughs> we, we were restored. Uh, our friendship was much restored years after that. Before it quite split, I escaped to the BBC, left all politics um, with a great sigh of relief, but feeling that I'd learned a lot. Uh, there was, I mean, it's possible it could have worked. I mean, it, really the lesson is, as both Charles and Vince have said, is you can't fuck the electoral system, you just can't. Um, a few evenings before the Limehouse Declaration, my uh, late husband, Peter Jenkins, who was a political writer, and I spent the evening with Dennis and Ed Edna Healy. And Edna was trying to persuade Dennis to come over to the SDP. Dennis had been thoroughly humiliated in the Labour Party at the Wembley Conference, and Edna wanted him to. It would have made a colossal difference. I mean, 29 Labour MPs, most of them not particularly well known, apart from the Gang of Four, was not enough. If Dennis had come over, I think a very large number of people would have done. There were a lot of people teetering on the edge of the sort of Roy Hattersley kind, um, would have gone with him. He said, and I think wisely, 
he'd seen quite enough of the left being split all around Europe. He was a great expert on European politics. Uh, and he had seen what happened and he is right. Um, even to this day, now the split of the left in this country uh, shapes our politics. You know, there's always been a majority for non-Tory, left of Tory uh, in every election. In the last local election in May, for instance, this May, we had enormous local elections because it covered everything. It was sort of two years in one. 85% uh, of the candidate, of, of, in 85% of the seats for the local elections all over the country, there was just one Tory sitting, but there were two or three uh, alternative Labour, uh, uh, Lib Dem or, or Green candidates. And so, of course, they were not going to do well. Um, it is, seems to me essential that we do have an alliance. We are not going to break the system unless we can have a single election where an alliance on the left holds together and says it's just for one time only, it's just to break the system. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do. We talk about blood on the floor, the, the division of seats between the Liberals and the SDP, which was, I think it was mostly, um, uh, I, 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 it, it was, there were golden seats, uh, which seemed winnable, and the fight over who was going to get the golden seats and who would stand down, and some long-standing Liberal candidates were going to have to stand down. That was more blood on the floor. It was very painful, very difficult. I don't know if it's conceivable that that could be done again. I don't think it's probably enough to have candid just paper candidates standing. I was saddened that at the Lib Dem conference, they said, uh, at, which we've just had, it was agreed that they, they would stand a candidate in every seat. And you think, why on earth is that really necessary? Labour has it in their constitution. Is that really necessary? Is there any point in standing in hopeless seats, particularly after Cheshire and Amersham? And we've seen what can be done. I'm true, Labour didn't campaign there, barely, uh, which was good. But uh, it would be a very good thing if we could get a progressive alliance going. I'm, I'm not hugely optimistic, but I will argue for it and fight for it as best I can. Uh, I think that, you know, it has so distorted our politics, this system. There should have been an option to vote for Kent Clark, uh, pro-Europeans versus the Brexiteers, if you were a Tory, how appalling to have to put your ex in that box and not be able to describe which side of the Tory party you're voting for. Ditto with the Labour Party, you voted for the left or right, a very big difference. Um, and, you know, unfair that your, your vote should be taken for granted by one side or the other, which was not worry, what you intended when you, when you voted. I think, um, the left of the left has always under the far left has always understood its only hope was to capture Labour, and on some occasions it has uh, under Michael Foot, you could say, and under Jeremy Corbyn it succeeded, and now you see with the grassroots Labour movement time and again, all they're doing is trying to capture the Labour Party. In their the emails that I get from them all the time. There's virtually nothing about the Tories and what's going on in the country and, and what campaigns should be fought. It's all about the internal labour mechanisms and internal labour rules, uh, because capturing the Labour Party is possibly the height of their ambition. Maybe they don't much mind about winning an election if they can only become, uh, a, a, if they can only take over the party. This is, um, you know, these awkward unhappy coalitions of these portmanteau parties are very destructive, it denies voters a choice, it makes people cynical. Um, I think it produces very bad government because you see a very abrupt swing at each election, pendulum swinging policies from one side to the other quite sharply. Charles has been an education minister and uh, you know the arrival of Michael Gove in what was then called the Children, Families and Education Department. But the first thing he did was to rip down every sign that said Sure Start, Every Child Matters, that said Children and Families. No, this is only education. Uh, sure Starts were closed down, mostly. And, uh, you know, 
everything that had been built was taken down simply because it was the other side. If you have a proportional system, you don't get these violent swings, you get coalitions. Uh, and that seems to me a far better way of, of governing a, a country. Um, I, think, I think Charles has been harsh on the SDP not having ideas. It felt to us like an absolute liberation to create policies from nowhere, from with no, no new ideas. And there were a lot of them. If you look at the 1983 manifesto, it's quite radical. It's a lot more radical than the Blair Brown um, manifesto was, which is after all a modest affair. They did much more than they said they would do. Um, and I think, um, I, you know, I'm very sad the SDP didn't succeed. The only other point is, is it possible that the SDP did help the Brown Blair, the Blair Brown era of new labor get off the ground? Possibly. Some people say it delayed it. Uh, all we did was prevent Neil Kennett being elected. Others will say, actually, we, we led the way. I hope that that's the case. I hope we weren't destroyers, but don't ever do it again. Great, lots, lots to chew on there. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Julie. Thank you, Colm. I'm not quite sure what the thinking was behind the order of the speakers. Um, I'd initially seen a programme that just had us in alphabetical order. And I wonder whether there's an attempt to have somebody that moved to the SDP and stayed in the SDP and the counterpart, Charles, somebody that moved to the SDP, moved back to Labour, and then moving towards two of us who hadn't been involved in the Labour Party before the creation of the SDP, in one case, because Peter wasn't yet born, and in my case, because I was only 12. And the SDP, you asked earlier, was it true that I'd got involved when I was 12? And the answer is yes. I grew up in a place that now people have tended to forget, called Crosby. So when people ask me where I'm from originally, I now say Liverpool. But there was a brief period in my life when I could say I'm from Crosby, and everybody knew where I was from because they knew about the by-election. And I grew up about a five minute walk from the SDP campaign headquarters in the by-election. So why did I get involved? Precisely for the sort of reasons that Polly was talking about. And I think Charles was overly critical, but for many people in the early 1980s, politics was so polarized that a new party that did have ideas, that had a clarity of vision, sounded to be of interest. If the SDP hadn't been set up, I probably would just have been a Liberal from day one. I'd watched David Seale at the 79 election and thought, this chap seems to be talking some sense. And then at my secondary school, one of my teachers said to me, you might be interested in this new party that's just been set up. And so I read up on the Limehouse Declaration um, as an avid little swat of a schoolgirl, and thought, hmm, this does sound quite interesting. And so when the by-election came along, I got involved. And the things that drew me to the party were very much that there seemed to be a left of center vision, one that cared about people. It wasn't just about petty infighting. It wasn't veering to the extremes of left or right. But it also said absolutely the right things as far as I was concerned then and now about defence and about the UK's relations with Europe. And I thought back in the 1980s that defence and Europe were two things that were vitally important. I'm now the Liberal Democrat defence spokesperson in the House of Lords and my day job is teaching European politics. So there's a bit of consistency in my areas of interest. But unlike Vince, I, well, I'm sorry, I've, I'm putting words into Vince's mouth. He might want to disagree. Um, I assume Vince voted for Marjorie in 1988. I didn't vote for Marjorie in 1988. I thought that actually having separate parties was actually a good thing. And I also felt that the SDP and that manifesto that Charles thought was so lily-livered of 1983 actually 
articulated values that spoke to me and I thought many other people. There is, I think, a place in British politics, as in continental politics, for a variety of parties where we are able to have distinct views. What the problem, as other speakers have already said, is our electoral system. But I think there are many people across the Liberal Democrats, but I suspect also still in the Labour Party and parts of the Conservative Party, who might feel much happier if they were liberated from the party labels that they actually have, that the Liberal Democrats still have at least two wings, one that has the traditional liberal part of the party, and those of us who are still the relics of the SDP. And then there are a lot of new members whose views are very different, who transcend the old liberal SDP divide. But we don't necessarily across the party all have the same views. Labour and the Conservatives, I suspect if we had an electoral system that was more representative, might well have split again in the case of Labour or split further or split for the first time or in recent times in the case of the Conservatives. But there are some in the Conservative Party, like David Liddington, who surely has rather less in common with the vast majority of the current cabinet than he might have probably with any of us on this panel. That there, there, the nature of our politics has been forced into blocks by the electoral system. I'm not sure I agree with Charles about the AV system that we were invited to vote on in 2011. I think that actually highlighted one of the real problems that while people have diverse views on political issues, on electoral reform, A, it's very difficult to make anybody interested apart from the geeks, either academic or political. Most people aren't going to get excited about AV, AV plus, STV, and yes, I'm deliberately using all the abbreviations because that's the, the way the discussion goes into. But what we do need is some sort of system that allows us to have a more representative um, parliament. I have always been a little bit reluctant to say the Liberal Democrats should cozy up too much to the Labour Party and even more anxious about becoming too close to the Greens because there is a very real danger that if you are the small party then or a small party it's very easy for another relatively small party particularly at local level to gain ground and then take take you on in local council elections and instead of it being lots of Greens and lots of Liberal Democrats um, you find that actually you're out of office. So there's always a bit of a danger in cooperation in a first past the post system. But I confess that I'm now moving towards the view that Polly has, that we need to be thinking much more about cooperation across party lines. And I think it is fine for people to stand candidates in all constituencies, but we don't necessarily have to campaign actively in all constituencies. So Batley and Spen, the Liberal Democrats had a candidate, but there wasn't a concerted effort to throw everything into that by-election. We let Labour do that. The reverse with Chesham and Amersham. So I think there are ways in which you can stand a candidate which ensures that at least your party label is represented and you've got the opportunity of reminding people that we exist. And I, you might think that this is just me as a parliamentarian saying that, but some years ago, my late mother got in touch with me and said, I spoilt my ballot paper. Um, she had moved from Crosby, which had, used to have a Tory majority of 20,000 to Bootle constituency, which was rather the reverse for Labour. And the Lib Dems hadn't put up a candidate in the local elections. And so she said, well, I didn't have the chance to vote for a Liberal Democrat. And so the next election, she stood as a paper candidate. 
And I think that sort of activity is quite good, but there will be some people who won't vote Labour if they are embedded Liberal Democrats or Greens. There will be some people who will ne never vote for another party, but others will. And it's trying to work out how best to ensure that people can be represented, but also that people who wish to lend their vote to another party can also be encouraged to do so. And I think a lot more discussion needs to be happening on a cross-party basis to allow that to happen. And if that can be a legacy that means we can improve the left of centre position, but bearing in mind that our electoral system hasn't changed, then I think that could be a desirable outcome. Thank you very much. Lots to chew on there. And I can neither confirm nor deny any speculation about the order of speakers, but uh, interesting comments nonetheless. Um, I now can turn to Peter to uh, have the final seven minute introductory remark. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to join this distinguished panel. Um, as, as Julie says, I, I wasn't even alive in 1981 and I have no personal memories of, of the SDP. Uh, so I'm afraid this is going to be a purely historical contribution. Um, I, th I think the, the point I want to make really, um, the main point I want to make is that um, as a historian of, of, of liberalism, um, that I think sometimes the STP has been seen primarily through the lens of its formation and, um, and through the lens of internal Labour Party politics. And then the alliance has been seen through the lens of the STP, which of course was much better connected in political and academic circles than the Liberal Party was. Um, and, and so I think there is an argument for um, trying to place the alliance a bit more firmly in the longer context of third party politics um, in, in Britain and to see it as something that built on the ideas and the electoral support that the Liberal Party had, had developed in, in the 1960s and 70s. And um, let me make that argument, first of all, on, on an ideological level. I think that um, if you look at the, um, the STP and the Alliance, um, intellectually, it was at least partly a response to the problems Britain had faced in the 1970s um, and the perception that the UK faced relative economic decline, concerns um, about the apparently endemic conflict um, between management and, and, and trade unions, which went beyond the internal divisions within, within the Labour Party. Um, and if you look at Roy Jenkins's Dimbleby lecture, um, which I don't think anyone has mentioned yet, um, mm -hmm. you know, the central thesis is that the causes of Britain's malaise um, were ultimately political ones. Um, that politics had become frozen in a class-based two-party mould, which was making the country impossible to govern. And, and so the way to, to break the cycle of government failure um, was to overhaul the constitution and the party system so that coalitions would be the norm as they were in the apparently successful, apparently more successful democracies of Western Europe, particularly West Germany. Um, so that policy change was more incremental um, instead of swinging violently from, from right to left. Um, the government, sorry, the, the, the government would therefore have more authority um, in, in making an incomes policy stick and therefore making Keynesian economics more, more viable than it seemed in, in the context of the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and that businesses would have the confidence to invest because they knew that they weren't going to be nationalised, um, or at least they weren't going to be nationalised unless the Liberals or, or Social Democrats agreed to it. Um, and that there wouldn't be sweeping changes in, in the tax system in the way that there were in the, the aftermath of every change of government um, between 1964 and, and 1979. And even though this argument became associated with Roy Jenkins, um, liberals like Jeremy Thorpe and John Pardo and David Steele have been making it repeatedly um, since the early 1970s. Uh, and of course, in, in 1974, the liberals took almost 20% of the vote and um, made a, a national breakthrough in, in terms of votes, um, albeit not in terms of seats. Um, and political scientists like S.E. Finer in Oxford um, were at that point writing quite influential um, attempts to theorize this critique of so-called adversary politics. Now, that liberal diagnosis of Britain's problems in, in the 1970s obviously wasn't without its, its weaknesses. 
But I think it was the most coherent and forceful attempt which British liberals have offered, um, really since Labour replaced them as the main party of the left in the 1920s, um, to, give their, um, to give their electoral pitch a sense of, of urgency. Um, because it meant that the case of proportional representation, for instance, wasn't just, um, wasn't just a matter of fairness, but it was also a matter of efficiency. Um, the, the Liberals wanted to break the two-party system, not just for its own sake, but because they thought that was a way of making Britain governable again. And I think this is, is one reason why the, the Falklands War um, was so damaging to, to the SDP, as, as several speakers have mentioned. Because before the Falklands, you know, in, in the depths of the 1980-81-82 recession, Margaret Thatcher's government looked like another failed government driven by ideology, engaged in a monetarist experiment, and becoming deeply unpopular as, as unemployment soared. And, and, and then the Falklands War happened, and all of a sudden, Margaret Thatcher looked like a winner. And it's really interesting that if you look at the STP's focus group reports, um, which may have come to the committee that, 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 that Polly Tonby was on, I, I, I don't know, um, but, but can be found now in the University of Essex archives, um, you can see that the argument that the alliance was the only way of achieving stability and, and coherence in policy and, and national unity um, basically ceases to resonate in the course of 1983. Um, that once Mrs Thatcher looks like a winner, um, then she's able to make the argument that the best way to stop the swings of the pendulum between right and left is, is to re-elect the Conservative government and, and let Mrs Thatcher get, get on with the job. So I think, in other words, the, 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 the urgency which the Alliance is able to instill in its argument in 1981 to 82 ceases to be so, so powerful after the Falklands. Another thing that comes very interestingly out of the same focus group reports is that um, whereas David Steele had believed that Roy Jenkins would be an enormous asset to the SDP and, and, and the Alliance, and lots of the polling that had been taken out, uh, that had been done during the 1970s, had assumed that um, bringing in Labour politicians with ministerial experience and a kind of gravitas would be a real asset to the Liberals in, in kind of making up the Liberals' deficiencies. Um, it, it, it's much less clear that that turned out to be the case in, in practice. Um, the focus group um, report says, quote, that by 1982, Jenkins was seen as a professional politician with all the negatives that entailed, uh, associated with Europe, good living and, and being old. And, and so as a kind of more, po more populist and anti-establishment mood took, took hold during the 1980s, some of those assets which the, the Gang of Four brought with them became less and less, um, less, and less helpful. Um, and I think actually that the way the SDP came to dominate the Alliance's image in the 1983 campaign and the 1987 campaign may have been counterproductive um, because it crowded out some of the more anti-establishment notes in, in the Liberal appeal and, and prevented David Steele, who after all, as, as Julie said, had, had been a very effective campaigner in, in 1979 from fulfilling his, his potential. Um, the final thing I want to say very briefly is that I think in some ways parties might find it harder to, to break the mould, even than the SDP and the Liberals found in, in the 1980s, um, because um, the SDP and the Liberals had two advantages um, that are less apparent today. And the first is that um, mass media was, was dominant and, and television, particularly during election campaigns, gave the third party, the Liberals and then the Alliance, uh, almost a guaranteed share of, of coverage um, that tended, um, at least for the Liberals and, and I think probably for the Alliance in 83 as well, to be pretty favorable coverage. Um, so election broadcasts were divided in a 5-5-3 ratio in the 1960s and 70s, in a 5-5-4 ratio in 1983, and in a 5-5-5 ratio um, in, in 1987. In other words, there was parity between the three main contenders. At the same time, um, parliamentary deposits were a bigger obstacle to small parties um, running candidates across the country. Um, you only kept your deposit um, if, if you got 12.5% or more of the vote. Um, now it's only 5%. 
and the real terms value of, of the deposit um, has, has, has fallen. And so whereas it's probably easier to set up a new party now and to run candidates to get some media coverage, it's much harder for a third party to bundle together the kind of none of the above vote in the way that the Liberals and, and the Alliance were able to do and, and, and kind of use that to, um, to challenge the, the two main parties. And so if anything, I think the two party system is perhaps more secure now in the age of social media and fragmentation and you know six or seven candidates in many constituencies um, than it was in the 1980s. And, and maybe um, the, um, the small gap between um, the Alliance vote and the Labour vote in 1983 is, is something that would be very difficult to, to repeat. Thank you very much. Again, lots to chew on there. Um, I've got a couple of questions already. Um, so if it's okay with the panelists, I'm gonna launch straight into them. But of course you can respond to each other as well as to the questions if you wish. Um, as, as a reminder, if you want to ask a question, you can put it into the very lively chat or you can put it into the Q&A function and I'm, we will try and get through them this evening. So I'll begin with um, a question. A, a couple of the panelists mentioned voting systems. Um, so we already know the, the answer to this from Charles, but he might want to speak further on this. Mark Williams asks, which voting system do candidates prefer? And adds to that, is there any merit to revisiting Roy Jenkins's proposals on electoral reform prepared for Tony Blair in the late 1990s? So perhaps for this one, we'll go back in the order we went. Um, so let's maybe start with um, uh, Vince Cable, if that's okay. Yes, I, I, I really hope we're not going to reinvent the wheel in, in this debate about proportional voting and representative uh, parliament. Um, and Tony Blair commissioned uh, Roy Jenkins to produce a report. It was one of the best things he did, I think, um, and came up with a kind of hybrid compromise solution, which drew on approximately to the system they have in Germany, but with modifications, and to uh, which has some echoes in, in the Scottish um, parliamentary voting. It has essentially a constituency-based system, but where you make up for um, lack of proportion through a, uh, an additional set of members. And you can argue about the details, but it seemed to me to meet the requirements that most people are likely to have. But I, I really hope as a country, and in terms of the various parties supporting um, voting reform, that we're not going to reopen all the Pandora's box about wouldn't it be wonderful to have um, an Irish STV system or, or something fundamentally different? And we, we, we exhaustively went through the options with Jenkins, who did a very good job of narrowing them down. And I think we should work with his conclusions. Thank you. Charles, do you have anything to add to what you said in your contribution? Yes. Firstly, there are two different questions. One, how do you promote what Polly rightly called for working together between parties? And second, what is the right electoral system? They're related but different questions. On the working together point, uh, I just want to remind you of the agreement in 1903 between Herbert Gladstone, then the Chief Whip of the Liberal Party, and Ramsay MacDonald, the Secretary of the Labour Representation Committee, that in 30 constituencies they named, the Labour Party and the Liberal Party would not stand against each other and thus would avoid the risk of splitting their vote. As a result of that agreement, in the 1906 general election, in contests against the Conservative Party, 29 Labour MPs were returned. It's, I think, the only example of a pre-election pact. All the other pacts are a result dealing with the actual fact of the vote and people having to work together, whether you're talking about David Steele or whatever. Now, it's very interesting that that happened. Uh, Ramsay MacDonald, an absolute tribune of the left at that time, uh, not with his subsequent reputation following him being prime minister. And I've toyed, I toyed in 1992 with could we persuade um, half a dozen uh, uh, Labour parties in local constituencies where to stand down in favour of the Lib Dems unilaterally, not through an agreement, but unilaterally, because I thought that would work much better. I even did the figures, I looked them up in 2019. If that were to happen, there were about 20 seats where the... Uh, uh, majority of the Conservatives over the Lib Dems was massively less than the Labour vote. And actually, that would have changed the whole process. 
obviously nothing happened in those areas. But I do think that question that Polly raises about how do, how do parties work together, and they don't have to, as I say, it can be unilateral actions rather than actually working together to promote a more collegiate approach. And that informs what I said about the electoral system. The reason why I favour alternative vote is because I think it allows people to say, well, if you don't vote for us, vote for someone else. And that promotes a sensible conversation, both about policy and about practice in different localities. Proportional representation doesn't do that purely. Um, I didn't support the um, Jenkins Commission proposals because it was nearer the German system, but I've always felt, and I continue to believe, that the constituency system is absolutely core to the British parliamentary system. And if you have a, a supplementary list, which is what the Jenkins proposals were and what, for example, the current German system is, I think that takes away that element from the situation. I also think it has the disadvantage of making it complicated. I used to be in favour of uh, one, uh, a one-clause bill to reform all elections in Britain, which is re replace the X in the ballot paper by a one, two, three system, which would mean in single member seats, it's the alternative vote. In uh, um, multi-member seats, as in local government, it would be some form of local STV system. But I think people get completely lost, individuals. I think it's a weakness of our current political situation that you have different forms of election in Scotland, Ireland, uh, London, nationally, and so on. And I don't think anybody who's in the in the general electorate understands any of this. So any reform has to be very simple. And my favoured simple reform is alternative vote in single member constituencies, which I think would promote the kind of conduct by political parties, uh, which is desirable. Holly? I'm sighing to myself, sadly, saying, oh dear, here we go, down that rabbit hole. I mean, the reason that the House of Lords has never been reformed <clears throat> uh, since it was first tried in, what, 1911, uh, was is that uh, everybody then falls out over what they want to replace it with. And you get unholy alliances between Enoch Powell and, I can't remember who it was, Enoch Powell and Michael Foot or whatever. Um, all wanting different things, and as a result, it never gets reformed at all. The trouble with Charles's thing about AV, anything called AV, it's quite difficult to put forward again because it was lost in a referendum. It was a scandalous and disgraceful referendum that should have warned everybody right. about what would happen in the Brexit referendum because disgraceful lies were told about what it was and what it meant and what it would do and not do. Uh, Dominic Cummings and Matthew Elliott cut their teeth on uh, how to spread total dishonesty as uh, in that AV referendum. It was also revenge against David Steele. It was thought to be for him. David Steele was insane to have agreed to a referendum unless he'd got the Tories to sign in blood to pack it all, all the way. So that was a disaster, but I think it'd be difficult to have another one on AV. But I agree with Vince that I thought the Roy Jenkins system worked very well. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with the supplementary list because you still people still have a constituency MP. In fact, there's a supplementary list on the side just prevents the gross distortions that we get now in this system. And I thought it was quite a good blend, but it does make my heart sink that the moment we talk about the principle of electric reform probably don't lose this audience but most audiences we would have lost by now they'd have thought mm, time for a cup of coffee or a drink i'm off um and the question is how we have this debate and get everybody lined up behind one particular system without this happening thanks got loads of questions but i will go to julie and peter to see if they want anything to add to this one now, I think we've probably discussed the electoral system enough at this stage. Um, I don't agree with Charles that people can't manage a bit of complexity, um, but whether there's a perfect electoral system is another matter. All I will say is that first past the post definitely isn't the best, best solution. It doesn't even give us a stable government that it was always wanted to do. 
I would just add to that that I, I haven't got a copy of the Alliance Manifesto in front of me, but I don't think there was any suggestion in 83 or 87 that there would be a referendum on, on PR. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. But that is now established thanks to, um, I guess, the Scottish and Welsh Parliament, uh, Scottish, yeah, Scottish and Welsh Parliament referendums in, in 1997 as the established way of doing constitutional reform. Um, the centre-left in recent years has been very bad at referendums in, in, the, in this country. And if you're going to win one, you need a very clear justification um, for why um, people should vote for change that is not just about being fair to liberal politicians. And, and even though I'm supportive of PR, I, I think that is still something that PR supporters are, are grappling with. Great. Thank you very much. Um, maybe a different angle on this. We've... Uh, We've all many of the contributions have assumed that gaining seats in Parliament is uh, very important. But I've got an interesting question here from Rob Saunders from Queen Mary, who asks: There are two third parties that have had a transformative effect on British politics in recent years: UKIP and the Brexit Party. Yet neither won any seats in Parliament, other than two MPs who defected from the Conservatives. Are there any lessons that third parties of the left might learn from their approach today? I think I'm just going to throw that one out and see if anybody wants to come in. Can I come in on that one? Yep. European Parliament elections. Um, that one of the key things, and I, one might have a quibble with Rob about how different UKIP and the Brexit Party were in terms of Brexit sort of replacing the original UKIP party. So in a sense, they're both Nigel Farage parties. But the key thing was a different electoral arena, which, of course, used a form of PR. And that's been one of the things in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and in England through, well, sorry, those because of different electoral systems for their governments, but also in the European elections, regional lists allowed parties to come through. It benefited the Liberal Democrats for many years, but it enabled the, those parties to come through. And so it's a combination of a different electoral arena and a different electoral system that has made a difference. But Rob's right, you can make a real difference without actually having a seat in Westminster. Yes, I just agree with that from a slightly different point of view. I mean, you're right, they've had a phenomenal impact on UK politics, but mainly because they frightened the Tory party. I mean, they, yeah. they frightened the Tory party that they would lose vast amount of votes and seats. So the Tory party adapted to their position. And you could argue that one of the achievements of the SDP and, and, and its later um, link with the Lib Dems, through the Lib Dems, was that it helped to mold the Blair agenda. I mean, they, they wanted to co-opt, um, the Labour Party wanted to co-opt uh, a lot of that support, um, which they knew was out there and had a very popular ring to it. So. You know, one of the indirect benefits of the SDP was was to create that change of mood, but clearly not as decisively as UKIP, which, as you rightly say, was one of the most successful political movements in modern history. Julie's quite right, Con, to say that the different electoral system for the European elections, particularly on relatively low turnout, mm. allows a massive exaggeration of the relative significance of the political party. Uh, and that was uh, UKIP was very successful in that process. Uh, many years ago, the Greens had a very good European election, I remember, uh, which just faded away thereafter. But then Vince is right that the question is, what is it that changes the behaviour of the main political parties? And there's no doubt in the case of Labour that the STP split and the pressure that put Labour under changed Labour politics, uh, not just with Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, but also with Neil Kinnock as leader as well, in the sense of thinking, if we go on like this, we will be uh, simply not able to get elected. And so we have to think it wasn't so much the specific SDP policies, it was the fact of a force there which illustrated dramatically the weakness of the current party. Same again with the Conservatives and, the, and UKIP. It was UKIP's challenge which forced the Conservatives to move in their direction in exactly the same way. But that's not really a consequence of the electoral system. It's really a consequence of the general... Uh, fear which the main parties have of being outflanked in some sense.
Right, it seems like everybody's wanted to respond to that question has. I've got a few questions that are related, so I'm going to ask three of them. I think they're related, but that might just be uh, an authoritarian chair, but I am going to ask all three of them. So the first one is, is a, a quick one from um, John Newham, which was, was the SGP a necessary catalyst for New Labour, coming back to Polly's question. And then I think related questions are one from Duncan Brack, what was the policy inheritance of the SGP for the Liberal Democrats? Were there any policies that the Lib Dems hold that, that they wouldn't otherwise if the SGP had never happened? And then um, David Klemper asks, he wants the panelists to ask a little, to say a little bit more about the ideas and attitudes that they think the SGP represented. And is there, again, is there any kind of SGP tradition that survived the demise of the party? So I'll throw those questions open. And again, um, any panelist who wants to respond on that can come back. Well, I would argue, um, sorry, Polly. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll come back on, on the question of what good influence uh, did the SDP have on creating new labour? And new labour was an immensely successful creation. Um, I think there was a lot in the, in the tone and the style of new labour that did come from the SDP at its best. Um, and I think that... Uh, I think Tony Blair probably learnt a great deal from, from, from the, the style of those days. Um, there was a point at which, when everybody was trying to think what the SDP should be called, New Labour was actually one of the names put forward as a, 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 as a possibility. So maybe that's where they got that from. Uh, how different would the SDP have been if it had called itself New Labour? Well, it wouldn't have got, I mean, 25% of its votes, I think, um, came from Labour, but quite a significant number one came from Tories. 60% of its votes came from people who had not been a member of any, sorry, of its members, became not a member of any party before. I think, um, I think there was a, a freshness about the STP uh, that, that, that did cross over. I think um, a resistance to being defined by either right or left too much. Um, I think that uh, crossed over. Whether those benefits uh, outweigh the schism that was caused, I still think that, I'd, I still don't think that Michael Foote could ever have won, but possibly Neil Kinnock could have done. That was closer. Uh, I think it's just possible that the SDP did deny Neil Kinnock the chance to be uh, Prime Minister, and he would have been an interesting one, I think. A man who travelled a very long way. When the facts changed, he changed his mind. He was politically flexible and understood uh, where the, what was happening with uh, voters. And uh, perhaps we should regret that we didn't have Prime Minister Kinnock. But I'd like to hear Charles on that. Well, obviously, I think Prime Minister Kinnock would have been a very successful Prime Minister. I think he was a successful party leader by comparison with many in terms of seats gained. But sadly, that was never to be. I don't think the reason why Neil never became Prime Minister wasn't the SDP, though. I don't think the SDP was responsible for that. My answer to the question is, was the SDP a necessary catalyst for the new Labour style? I would quibble with the word necessary. I think it was something that contributed towards changes. It's interesting, Polly used the word style and the questioner did. Maybe that's true, but I think there are many potential catalysts for uh, both New Labour, but I would argue the changes that were made before Tony Blair became leader uh, in Labour that were done over a, a decade, uh, principally by Neil. Uh, but I don't think that um, uh, you needed to have a division in the Labour Party to achieve the new situation that, that we got. And I think the schism in overall brought more damage than, um, than benefits. Obviously, three of you were SDP members and actively involved in SDP at the beginning and therefore could see the positives in the SDP. And you've described them very well this evening in a, a way that I find difficult to identify with in, in that way. I wasn't saying, actually, that the SDP policies didn't have content uh, or, or was I saying they were lily-livered. I was simply saying that the greater motivation for people to vote for the SDP and, and maybe for some people to join was opposition to the main parties rather than the actual policy portfolio that was put out either in the Limehouse Declaration or subsequently. Um, 
And I certainly think it's true that because there are many what I'd call common sense policies in the STP manifesto and so on, uh, many of those policies were adopted by uh, Labour, adjusting not, not just after Tony Blair's leadership, but also uh, in the 1992 general election and through our policy review process. And that was fine because there were pl plenty of perfectly sensible things put forward by the SDP. But my argument was it wasn't those things which were the core reason why people uh, joined the SDP or moved on. It was the opposition to the way in which particularly Labour, but all, both the main parties were conducting themselves. Just to address the question, I think it was Duncan asked about what, what, what were the SDB policies that were carried through into the um, Lib Dems and have made a difference. I don't think it was the specifics. I think it was the insistence on having a, a national framework, a basic framework. I mean, the Liberals were absolutely brilliant at local com uh, campaigning, and that's how they'd survived and built up their strength. Um, but like that kind of instinct to, to, that you need a, an overall manifesto and an overall framework of thought, um, I, I benefited enormously. I'd never have become an MP had it not been for the local community campaigning that the Liberals brought. For example, you know, collecting newspapers in the first um, bout of recycling we had in this country. That came from the Liberals, not from the Greens originally. Uh, but it, it was the putting of those two things together which was the you know the SDP national policy framework and the and the liberal community campaigning that made the, made for a successful fusion. I wonder if you had any quick thoughts on this, Peter, as the uh, the historian among us. Yeah, I mean, I was I was going to say that if you want one example of SDP policy that I think does carry through, then nobody um, in the Labour Party has really acknowledged this. It's it's anti-poverty policy. Um, that one of the big flagship proposals the STP had in, in 83 and 87 was Dick Tavern's plan for tax and benefit credits worked up very closely with the IFS, which was all about targeted in-work support um, in order to tackle child poverty. And, you know, in effect, um, you know, even though that wasn't front and centre of the 97 Labour Manifesto, it is in effect what Gordon Brown did through, through the tax credit system. Um, tackling poverty, yeah, okay, partly through the minimum wage, um, but mainly through through fiscal redistribution um, to, to those in need, in a way that the Labour Party traditionally has always been very cautious about. I honestly think that's very steep. I think it's to describe the Labour Party as not committed to anti-poverty policies, I think just stands absolutely in the teeth of history over uh, decades. Uh, and one can have an argument about it, of course, and I'm I'm trying to say that I think we should be uh, appreciative of some of the policy approaches that came through from the SDP. But I think the idea that somehow Labour wasn't an anti-poverty party uh, before the SDP arrived just doesn't survive a second's interrogation. Maybe I'm, uh, I've just had a text from a strong reform Labour person saying I'm, I'm being too soft in, in my comments on the SDP in this programme and maybe I should harden up what I'm saying. But when you say that really Labour's not a party about anti-poverty, I just, you know, I can't accept that. I, I, was, I guess I'm talking specifically about the mechanisms for tackling, for tackling poverty. Of course, there's plenty of debate about the mechanisms for tackling poverty um, and there are issues like the minimum wage and so on where I think uh, there's many things you can say about Labour in government that was that were about dealing with poverty. You've also got the social security system. Of course, Beveridge originally was a Liberal and, and we took a lot from that in the 45 government and uh, rightly so. But I, I just think that to categorise Labour as not anti-poverty is just absurd. No, no, no. I, I guess I'm, I'm talking specifically about, I mean, if you look at the 1970s, Labour's very hostile to family income supplement to in-work supplementation of, of, of workers' earnings. Um, and, and so I guess I'm, I'm talking about a very specific mechanism. Um, but no, I, I absolutely take your point. And I mean, in some ways, I think one of the problems the SDP had in 1987 was that Neil Kinnock was so effective at making an emotional critique, a really resonant critique of Thatcherism um, and of the inequality and poverty that, that Thatcherism had caused in a way that David Owen and David Steele maybe, maybe didn't manage to make. And, and 
I'm sure you, you, you must have played a, a very significant role in that. Let, let, I think there's a really important point here, Colm. I, I hear what you say, Peter. Somebody just commented on the chat. Uh, that he didn't think you, Peter, was suggesting that Labour's not an anti-poverty party, but the policies it enacted to combat poverty after 1997 were borrowed from the STP, is what he's saying. You've reinforced that to a certain extent. I can say that when Labour ran in the 87, 92, 97 elections, it borrowed policies in any area you care, any area you care to mention from a whole range of different people, including the STP, as I said earlier on. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think parties that seek to lead the country ought to, quote, borrow policies from other people and should interrogate itself about what is the right way to do anything, whether it's anti-poverty or a whole set of different issues. Um, and I think the sectarianism of those on the ultra left who say only our way of doing it is the right way to go is, um, is, is wrong and uh, counterproductive. You can say the same about nationalization, for example. If you're trying to get uh, a more effective economy in energy, to, in energy, for example, what's the right way to go about it? And the party that wants to lead the country ought to be uh, pay, taking in thoughts, inputs, reflections from a whole series of different ways. And so I suppose I, what I'm reacting against is a suggestion that somehow the SDP came along and said, here's this list of policies. And Labour said, blimey, that's the good set of ideas. I haven't thought about that before. Let's put them in our agenda. I don't think that happened at all. The change in Labour was to move away from its own sectarianism, that everything that happened in 1945 was the right way to do things, to a more broad approach to finding what was the right way to do things and to carry that forward. Not always rightly, mistakes were made and so on and so forth. But that's the approach which I commend, is trying to have a more fruitful policy debate and choose the right policy instruments to try and achieve the changes you need to make without being stuck in sectarianisms of various descriptions. If it's okay, I, I mean, that was a fascinating discussion, but I do have plenty of questions, so I'm going to move it on. Is that okay with the panel? Yeah. Yeah. Great, awesome. Um, right, so I have a couple of questions on um, the Progressive Alliance, which was again a, a theme of the, the uh, contributions from the panelists. So there's firstly one from Sam Palace, which is, how could Labour ever go into an alliance slash coalition with the Liberal Democrat Party that were um, that were in the coalition government? So in his words, um, apologists and facilitators of Tory austerity. But um, I, you know, I think you, you can get the argument. And then. Um, there's a, a different angle on the progressive alliance from an anonymous contributor, which is assuming that you favor a progressive alliance, formal or informal, what would be the first three practical steps which you would suggest to, to make it happen? Um, you know, and, and the, the, I think the questioner is saying, if, if you do agree with it, how would you go about doing it? Um, again, I'll throw that open to the panel. Um, I'd certainly have to answer about um... And I'd like to like to hear from Vince too. I, I do agree that uh, I'm still, when I stop and think about it, deeply shocked at what the Liberal Democrats agreed to in the uh, years of those five years of, of austerity. I mean, that first budget of George Osborne's was a horror and it did incredible amount of damage. I, I've written a book called The Lost Decade. It's all in there, chapter and verse and um, the damage was immense. And I don't feel that the Liberal Democrats should have signed up to that kind of alliance. I think they should have been free to, uh, they should have put their foot down, they should have been free not to vote for things of that kind. And if it had called another election, so be it. I think they did sign their name in blood to some pretty unconscionable things. But that's all in the past. That's not where we would be with the Progressive Alliance. Uh, I think Liberal Democrats have learned some bitter lessons. I think that anyway, you're not talking about a joint government except after PR. You're talking about a system for getting electoral reform that would then allow a shake-up of the entire political system. We'd see where it would fall out what parties would split, what we would end up with. We would end up with a coalition where we will all have to learn to work together. Not necessarily in exactly that kind of, the same kind of way that um, the Liberal Democrats did work together with the Tories. We would have to be used to working together, that's true. But I do think that you would find it would be impossible for um, a, a Conservative party that didn't have a majority 
to push through such extreme policies after uh, a PR system was in place. They would have to work much more closely with several other parties and they wouldn't ever be dominant in that way on the number of votes that they got as a minority. Uh, well, just to answer the specific thing thrown at me, uh, I mean, we inherited something called the Darling Plan from the Labour government, uh, which was a necessary set of measures designed to reduce the very large fiscal deficit. And in Alistair Darling's case, it was over seven years. And the coalition inherited that. And actually, um, that's what we finished up doing. I mean, the, the aim was to speed it up a bit, but it was basically the same structure. I inherited a very large government department, um, which had penciled in by the outgoing Labour government cuts of 25%. And that's what we finished up doing, no more, no less. Um, so there was a, actually a lot of continuity between what the coalition did and what Labour would have done had they finished up back in government. There would have been a different balance of uh, some things would, you know, I would have hoped that, that a more um, left-wing leaning government would not have cut local government to the same extent, but the cuts would have come from somewhere else. Um, our government was probably too soft on the defense budget. I mean, you can argue about the balance um, and there probably should have been more tax, uh, less emphasis on public spending, but the basic structure, austerity, was baked into the outgoing uh, Labour government darling plan. So, I mean, all this uh, attempt to imply that we embarked on a fundamentally different direction is absolutely absurd. I don't think darling would have done it. I don't think it would have happened. I don't think, I think there would have been a much more Keynesian attitude towards not creating uh, stagnation, which was created by the austerity, which uh, where other countries were springing back from the disaster of the crash. Uh, everything in Britain stagnated as a result of pulling in spending at a time when you should have been, you know, spending for many more years. You have to pull it in eventually, but not until growth is established. Uh, I don't well, think Darwin yeah. would have done that. I don't think Labour would have done that. Well, the <laughs> doing the way it. That Ken Clark always said about 1997, mm. when Labour said, we are sticking to Ken Clark's very rigid, uh, absolutely no spending for the first two years. Ken Clark roared with laughter and said, I had no intention of sticking to it. I think that's what would have happened. But they, they did actually implement the Ken Clark uh, spending plans so that was the they did it was a big mistake yeah. anyway um, yes i'm not at all sure that i am a supporter of a progressive alliance a phrase that's used uh, widely um i don't really know what it means um and i think there's a massive difference uh, about a pre-general election alliance and a post-general election alliance just as there is in every local authority in the country uh, an issue pre or post the local government election the post depends on the arithmetic that you face at the time in terms of the number of seats. And you have to deal with what exists. And as Vince and Polly have just been discussing, in the case of um, uh, 2010, the, arith the arithmetic uh, placed a number of options in front of uh, the political parties. I, I, we can have an argument about whether the right decisions were taken and so on. But the fact is, it's the post-election situation which leads to that discussion, led to the Liberal Conservative agreement. Uh, could it have been done better? Probably. Could, could it have been involved Labour? Possibly. The whole series of questions around that. But the question of going in before an election to a progressive alliance, I think it's a very romantic concept. I don't think it's at all clear that there is the level of agreement between Labour, Lib Dems, Greens, anybody else, to get that kind of uh, progressive alliance before a general election. Um, I think the question is much more tactical, even to rely on measures of electoral reform. The country would think it's ridiculous that when the, whatever's facing the country, the left so-called parties agree on electoral reform, but not on anything else. It doesn't stack up. I think it's much more, and I, I'm sorry to go back to Polly, but she right at the beginning rightly said, you've got to develop a, cli a climate in which there can be genuine dialogue between the parties about where you go. There was an effort to do that when Labour was in government, that we had so-called secret meetings with the Liberal Democrats in County Hall uh, in about 2001, 2002. But big elements of the Labour Party, notably the Deputy Prime Minister, 
were totally opposed to that kind of conversation even. You've got to get to a state of affairs where you can have a conversation about what these things be. Without the conversation, there is no possibility of working together, let alone a progressive alliance of some kind which can present itself as such in an election. I have another couple of questions, but before I do, Julie, um, we haven't heard from you in a while. I wonder if you have any thoughts on this, this question about the progressive alliance. I have a similar view to Charles in terms of what does a progressive alliance mean and is this really what we would be aiming to do? I think having some sort of cooperation that gets us to a situation where there is not a majority of Conservative MPs in Westminster is something we should be aiming at. And following on from various points about, well, you know, would you trust the Liberal Democrats? And the same question might be asked about other parties. I think there is a real difference between saying we're going to work together to try to get the Tories out compared with an electoral, a, a coalition that is put together post-election. And so I think there are areas where we have common cause, which is to have a left of centre government. And I'm sure Sam will come back and say, huh, well, she would say that and the Liberal Democrats aren't left of centre. Well, under Charles Kennedy, we were very clearly left of centre. And I think and some sort of cooperation that led to either a confidence and supply situation or even another form of coalition would actually be very different because the one lesson that the Liberal Democrats have learned from the bitter experience of 2010 is that, frankly, if you go into a coalition with the Conservatives, you end up with an electoral disaster afterwards and we're still paying the price. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Really fascinating discussion. Um, I have two more questions that are, that are related. Um, and again, I'm just going to throw these open. So the first is from Angus Riley. And I, I know Angus is going to be particularly interested uh, in David Owen because he's, I, I believe, a biographer of David Owen. But he's asked, how do you reflect on the social market economy propagated by Owen? And was it as right wing as characterized? But I think he's asking the panel to reflect on David Owen's distinctive intellectual contribution as well as his personal uh, contribution to the politics, which was discussed. And then uh, we have a question from Jeremy Nuttall, um, which argues that the alliance offered a vision of social welfareism with aspiration, as did New Labour, which returns to that discussion between Peter and Charles. Um, does progressivism today need a new version of this old intellectual synthesis? I'll say a word or two, if you like, about the um, social market. Please. Uh, it, it, only seemed, it only seemed right wing in relation to the far left of the Labour Party. I think now it looks pretty, pretty radical. I think it was the idea that you should be very flexible about what should be nationalised and what shouldn't be. And you should be willing to move the border one way or the other, depending on what's happening. I think Ed Miliband, um, having said, you know, we should nationalize the uh, uh, electricity, the energy system uh, has turned out to be uh, exactly the sort of flexibility that they've had, that uh, the SDP had in mind, that when necessity arises, when there's a good reason why, you don't do it for ideological reasons, you do it for practical reasons. Some things are better run by the state. I mean, the privatization of the water companies has been a scandal in which vast sums of money have been made mostly out of property deals uh, and the water companies have failed to fix the leaks uh, and have behaved disgracefully. It's a good example of where it just doesn't make sense. Um, the rail hasn't made sense and has effectively fallen back into being a nationalised business but it's something very odd about putting a lot of subsidy into something like rail that then goes into private pockets. Um, how do you pay a dividend out of uh, a state subsidy. Things that need subsidies probably need to be nationalised. And I think it was that sort of flexibility. And at the time, of course, it seemed rather right wing that you might accept that some things are better in private hands. Doesn't seem right wing at all now, it would seem very radical. I, I agree with what um, 
Polly just said. And my problem is I'm not sure that phrases like social welfareism or the social market economy um, give enough clarity as to what you're talking about. They're almost slogans that were used in political debates in the past, rather than um, helpful signposting to what the actual policies would be in particular circumstances as of today. So, um, and I, I suppose one would also say that right and left, right wing, left wing are phrases which aren't particularly helpful in these discussions. Uh, what is right, a right wing policy? What is a left wing policy? Is it about the market? Is it about the role of the state? What's the situation? I think one needs a much fuller discussion and apply it to particular areas. Uh, you can look at what's happened to gas companies today and say, is the, are the measures that were pursued, were they wise? in terms of um, efficiency or equity, in terms of providing uh, the gas supply. And, and that's the question that should be asked. And then say, well, what are the policy measures you move on from that? And I'd find that a better way of addressing it than using phrases like uh, social welfareism and the social market economy. In that thoughtful silence, I might suggest that we move towards final reflections. So if this is okay with the panel, unless anybody else has a specific uh, response to the question I just asked, I might go in reverse order. So I might start with Peter, if that's okay with you, to have any final reflections on, on the discussion and any lessons you've learned about the SDP after our conversation. And then we'll go back towards Vince. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. I think it's been fascinating to hear from, you know, um, Charles and Polly and, and, and Vince and Julie about their different experiences of, 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 of politics in, in the 1980s. And, and clearly, you know, the SDP is always going to be a party, um, you know, which, which in addition to its concrete legacy in British politics has also left a deep emotional legacy on, um, you know, everybody involved in the, the rupture. In, in the Labour Party in, in the 1980s and in the messiness of the merger negotiations at the at the end of the 1980s and clearly many people um, in the Liberal Party um, um, felt very strongly about how, how, how that was carried out and I, you know I, I think most of those most of those wounds are, are healing now and, and, and have healed now um, I um, yeah I, I, I am not um, I, I think we have shared um, light um, both on the advantages of, of you know, progressive cooperation, but also on the difficulties of, of a progressive alliance today. Um, I, I think what's, what strikes me in, in, in comparison with the 1980s is that we have been through a few years now in which both um, the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn and um, the Liberal Democrats in, in the Remain campaign um, have been fighting um, really quite ideologically charged um, battles and have almost marched their followers up to the top of a hill um, in the hope of um, achieving, some, uh, you know, achieving what they see as a very big prize. And we are now in the situation where both party leaderships are trying to march their, their parties down again into, um, I guess, more 1990s type terrain of compromise, transactional politics, tacit agreements, um, working out how they can replace the Conservatives by working together in a fairly low key way and, and training their fire on Boris Johnson. And both Ed Davey and even more Keir Starmer are, are finding that quite difficult. Um, both parties I think are, are losing members, um, but of course both party leaderships recognize that the big prize in, in the end is, is parliamentary seats. And if they can, um, if they can keep their focus on those target voters um, at the next election, maybe they will get the dividends that that they are hoping for, and and maybe the next election will be more like 1997 than than like 1983. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. I think somebody earlier on wanted to know what hope we could have, and I think Peter's tried to take us back to the realms of hope that you know, 1997 sounds like rather a good place to be at the moment. Um, look, there was one question in the chat that didn't really get picked up on about if Liberal Democrats had had experience cooperating um, with Labour, for example, in Liverpool. Oh, sorry, no, I'm, I'm sure I've misre misrepresented that. Um, 
sorry, had governed with the Conservatives in Liverpool during the era of Trevor Jones and Mike Story. And because I knew as soon as I said Labour, I thought that's never happened in Liverpool. Um, you know, why wasn't the experience used? And I think even if we were going to go back to a hung parliament and negotiating a coalition agreement again, I don't think we would necessarily want to do it in the way that was done in 2010, which was very hasty. If you look in other, at other countries, Angela Merkel might still be here on the 1st of January to do a New Year's Day speech um, as Chancellor of Germany if it takes them several months to form a new coalition. And I think there are ways in which British politics needs sometimes to move a little bit more slowly and we need to stop and think a little bit more about how we negotiate and how we use people. And so it's not a reflection on the SDP so much as on politics and how political parties use people in both senses of the word, because I think there are ways in which we could actually find a more effective politics if people's expertise were used rather than necessarily their shoe leather and the ability to go and deliver leaflets. So that I think probably ap applies across several parties. Um, and I think ways of actually thinking about the members and how members play into political parties is actually quite important. Colleague, concluding thoughts? I think I suppose I have to end with a, a note of optimism. Um, I have to hope that it is possible that some kind of progressive alliance, I don't know what it's called, maybe that's a pretentious name, some kind of deal is struck that uh, the parties of the left can agree not to stand against each other at the next election. I don't think, I mean, Charles seems to assume that there would have to be a whole lot of policy agreements. There does have to be not disagreements on really fundamental things. The one thing they will all agree on is quite how extreme this government has been. Look where we have been taken by Boris Johnson. Look at how we've been taken out of Europe and taken out of Europe on the basis of lies and untruths, all of which are coming home to roost. It's all being proved, the you know, project fear is where we're living right now. Uh, and the extremism of what we face and taking seriously uh, what the austerity uh, already has, that's already happened, but also the spending review is going to be very brutal. Education is still not, uh, schools are still not funded as well as they were in 2010, which is appallingly depressing. I think if we put together the reasons why much more unites us than divides us uh, of those who are not conservatives. And maybe some who are conservatives would consider uh, amongst voters uh, coming back again uh, when they see the reality, that the, dif the difference between the sloganeering, the sound bites, the promises, and the reality behind it. You know, the nonsense that, oh, Boris is sort of moving to the left only stealing some of the language. Alas, none of the content, I wish you were. Uh, I think there is real hope there that we could get uh, enough of an alliance going where people won't be standing against each other idiotically in seats where one party or the other has no hope. Uh, so let's hope for collaboration and cooperation. Thank you. Charles? Uh, a couple of things. Firstly, I am an optimist. Uh, I believe that Boris Johnson and the Conservatives will not form an overall majority government after the next election. I think the difference as to whether the left somehow can actually get a majority itself depends on how positive we are in the way we talk about. Secondly, Polly, I don't, uh, if I said that I thought the basis of electoral agreements has to be fundamental agreements on policy. That's not what I think. I think that, as you say, it's a question of not having uh, not having disagreements that are too great. And I absolutely think it is worth thinking about what kinds of agreement you can make before an election, which minimise the number of Conservative MPs. And uh, one needs to think flexibly about that. And the way towards that is to have much more discussion of this kind around these issues and get down to what you're actually talking about. I think the final thing, Colm, which has struck me is the elephant in the room of this whole conversation, which hasn't been mentioned the whole evening, 
which is the Scottish National Party. At the end of the day, unless there is some kind of agreement with the Scottish Nationalist Party, then it will not be possible for the non-conservative parties mm -hmm. to form a majority in Parliament, unless you believe the SNP is going to be wiped out in Scotland at the next general election, which I don't. So the question is, what is the nature of that agreement? In particular, what is the nature of that agreement on independence and independence referenda, which potentially is a massive gift to the Tories as they used in past general elections. I think that's a massive issue to wrestle with, and simply because of the size of the SNP, as compared to the Liberals or indeed any other minority party, will be a big issue, which requires a lot more thought. Interesting, the SNP only came up right at the end, yes. And finally, Vince. Um, just a few points. I, 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 th th Charles made some very good points earlier on, which I, I wanted to take up and respond to. I mean, the first is, how important it is to have a kind of ideological driver between in a new party or indeed any party. And I'd rather contest his view. Um, after all, the big adversary for most of us is the Tory party, who, with the exception of a few years under Margaret Thatcher, have almost been entirely devoid of any ideological uh, deep roots or consistency. Um, they've done a 180 degree U turn on the big issue of the day and apparently come out unscathed and rather the better for it. Um, the, the best hope for kind of centre left politics in the world is in the United States and its president got elected on the basis that he wasn't the other one. And the big issue at the next election and the election after will be having an alternative to the Tories and we're not get too hung up on visions and, and policy platforms. Uh, I think a second point he made, which is also very important, is the distinction between working together and voting systems, which may or may not help you to work together. I mean, I was part of a coalition where parties worked together very well, but it was a very unbalanced coalition because instead of our parties being represented in a ratio of roughly one and a half to one, which was based on our electoral support, uh, we were outnumbered by six or seven to one in terms of ministers and MPs. And of course, you've got an overwhelmingly Tory um, texture, um, to what, particularly towards the end of, of, of the administration because of arithmetic. Um, and until you get the, the, the voting system sorted and more representative voting, you're never going to get coalitions uh, which work together in, in, in a way that reflects public preferences. And then my final thought is um, I, I'm not worried about the language and progressive coalitions or whatever. I mean, I will be supporting the, the Dem candidates in the 25 or 30 seats, which we have a realistic chance of winning and then giving encouragement to good Labour candidates in Tory Labour marginals. And I'm not worried about what label you want to put on it. Thank you very much. And with that, I think we'll draw this fascinating discussion to a close. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists for giving us their time and insights this evening and to Progressive Britain for partnering with us for this event and to all of you for coming and asking such uh, probing and interesting questions. If you enjoyed tonight's event, do a come along to future Myland Institute panels. And as a reminder, you can keep up to date by signing up to our mailing list on our website and by following us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. A recording of this event will also be available on our YouTube channel in the morning. In the meantime, have a good evening and see you next time. Bye.